So what we are going to do going forward is we're going to use this book by Sestoft, uh, Java Precisely, a as uh, for our Java resource. And our textbook, our Benari textbook, also has some Java programs in it. And the programs that we're going to um, implement from these two books, we're going to modify them uh, slightly. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to modify them so that we can have the Java doc, uh, HTML documentation. I think that's a kind of a nice standard to get used to using when you program with Java. And it also allows us to uh, execute the command, the class file from the command line. We'll see, uh, we'll see how, so that we can take the input from the main program like we did with uh, C++. <clears throat> and another thing we're going to do is we're, we're going to rename the class to match the file name. So there's one, if you remember your Java project in uh, computer systems, if you took that class, you, you remember that when we programmed our big project in Java, that one of the uh, standards, standard practice, is to have the is to have one file per class or one class per file, and the file that the class is in has the same name as the class, and so we want to. That's a that's a coding convention that's quite common, and we're we're going to we're going to do that. Uh, that's so we're going to modify the code slightly from these two books to follow these two guidelines. So now let's take a look now then at how Java handles concurrency. Now it's really quite similar uh, to, um, to C++, namely the join uh, method. So in Java, what we have is not only do we have a p.join, but we also have a p.start. So in Java, you explicitly, when you execute, if p is a process, and you execute, and you want it to start executing, then p.start puts the thread p in the ready queue, or the enabled queue. So that gets it ready to run. And then p.join, which is executed by main, suspends main until the thread p terminates. So p.join in Java works exactly the same way that p.join works in C++. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to use Intelli the IntelliJ IDE. It's, it's uh, made by the same company that makes the C line one. So it's, I really like it because it has, the IDE is, is quite similar. And so if you know how to use one, you know how to use the other. OK, so here's the code for count a.java. First of all, we have a package, lowercase c count a, that has the same name as the class, but is all lowercase. And the package concept in Java is kind of the same kind of thing that the your includes work in C++. It's a way to manage uh, if you have multiple Java classes that you want to all execute as uh, together, you put them all in the same package, and then you don't have to include uh, the packages separately. And then uh, we have public class count a extends thread. So thread, capital T, thread is the built-in Java class. And extends is the Java terminology for inheritance. So what this is saying is that count a inherits from thread, which is the built-in Java thread class. And the next line is static, volatile, int, and gets zero. Now static, do you remember what static is? Static means one per class instead of one per object. So same meaning in Java as it is in C++. And then int and get zero. So that is an attribute of this class that we are defining in our code. So that is an attribute of the class. And then we int m, so m is also an attribute of the class. And then count a is, the, is a function with the same name as the class, so that's the constructor. And here we have <clears throat> my m is the parameter for the constructor, the uh, formal parameter for the constructor. And basically what the constructor does is it sets the attribute little m to the value of my big m, which is passed as a parameter. We'll see how that, how, we'll see how that works in the, when we do the main program. And now here is a big difference between Java and C++. In Java, when you 
have multiple threads running under one program, they all have to run the same code. So instead of having a one, co one piece of code for P and another piece of code for Q, in Java, they all have to run the same code. And, and run is a built-in method that you implement that, that is the code that executes when you launch, when you start your uh, processes running. And so here again, this code is the same as in C++, int t for int i get 0, i less than m. But now, instead of uh, having a parameter in run, we're using the lowercase m, which is the attribute of the class. So for int i get 0, i less than m, i plus plus, and then Tim gets in and gets Tim plus 1, as before. And now here is the <coughs> main program. And again, the main program here take, can take its input from the command line, like um, just like C++, that's how, that's how we're going to do it. And this parseInt is the same thing as, what was it in C++? String to S to I, string to integer. So it takes the string, which is all the arguments for the command line are all uh, presented to the main program as a string. So we have to parse that into an integer, and so that's my max. And then system.out.println, the value of my max is, and then whatever it is. And now here is how, here is how we, we launch our threads. We have p is of type count a, and we have, to, we have to execute it as new, so with the new command. So, so we say p gets new, and then count a my max. So count a is the class, and now here is where the constructor is called. So my max, which we got from the command line, is is being given to the constructor, is, is given as the actual parameter in the constructor to count a. And so and so that puts that and so that's that set that sets it up. And then count a q gets new count a does the same thing for q. And then p dot start puts the um, Starts it, puts it in the in the enabled queue, in the ready queue, and q.start does the same thing for queue. And now, instead of having to have just p.join and q.join uh, outside of this try statement, it's required to be in the try statement. Now we're going to talk about the try catch and the try catch finally statement in a lot of detail. And um, for now, let's just ignore that and just and we'll just uh, say that p.join executes and then q.join executes. And there are, uh, we'll, we'll talk about it in the try catch uh, statement later. And then we have system.out.println, the value of n should be, and then 2 times my max, and the value of n is. So this is kind of is exactly the same kind of code that um, is executed by our count a.cpp. And now what we're going to do is we're going to demo count a.java, show you how that works with the IntelliJ, and we'll also see how to take the um, input from the command line or from the IntelliJ program. And we will see, our conclusion will be, as with C++, the program works for small values of m, but, but not for large values of m. So let's do the demo. Okay, so here's our demo. First of all, what we're going to do is count a. So we'll take a look here. Now, the file structure is you have to kind of drill down here to see um, the actual source code. So, SRC is the source. Um, and this count A is the package. That's that package that we saw. And inside count A, here's count A.java. So, you double click this. And here is the code for count A that we looked at in the slides. And notice that this package count A up here corresponds to the fact that that the source file is inside this count A package. You can see this count A package here in the IDE. All right. And now, um, remember, it take, this program takes the input from the command line argument. So we do this in Java the same way, in this IntelliJ, the same way we do it in um, 
in uh, C Lion for C++. So, so first we, we go to Count A, Project, and then we look, we look at Edit Configurations. And here again, oh, I see there is already a program argument of 20. We'll change that to 10 just for fun. All right, and then we'll do OK here. And then we will run it. And are you ready? Drum roll. Compiling, running. The value of my max is 10. The value of max should be 20, and it is 20. So just like with C++. And here again, what happens is if we go up here and do our edit configuration and make it really big, like let's do 10,000 again. 10,000. And we run it again. And sure enough, it should be 2,000, 20,000, but instead it's 12,586. And each time we do this, it, we get a different uh, value, 12,743. One more time, 14,165. So the same phenomenon, all right? Now, the next thing we want to demo is this. What we're going to do is I want to show you how to do this on the how to do this on the command line. So we're going to go back and we're going to show you how to do the command line with um, C++. So here, if we switch to C Lion, notice that in C++ with C Lion, there is a file of directory here called CMake Build Debug, and inside this CMake Build Debug, there is actually this is where the executables are stored. So here's the executable for count A. And I want to show you how to do that to execute this on the command line. So what we're going to do now is we're going to switch over to um, the terminal. And so he, now here's another thing, you guys. At this point in your career, you really need to start learning how to do uh, Linux slash Unix bash. Bash is the born-again shell, shell programming on the command line. So ls stands for list direct, uh, list the files. And so if, if I do ls, press return, we can see here that I am in, that, I, uh, I, that, that Warford is, is, the, is my home directory. That's where we're starting out. And um, so now we want to go to documents. So we cd stands for change directory, cd to Oh, and by the way, there's a tab complete. I press tab, and it will complete that. CD to documents, and not see now it says that I'm in documents here. And now if I ls this, list the directory, that shows me all the things that are in my documents. And then my documents, one of them is classes here. So we'll go to CD to classes. And this class is Computer Science 450. That's this one. So we'll CD to that. And now here's all the stuff in there. And now this, now remember this CPP distribution? That's where the, um, that's where our software is for the C++. So we want to, we need to CD to that. I could actually just copy that and then paste it here. Um, oh, I forgot to CD. And now, do you remember we said that that, um, that file, uh, that directory was called CMake Build Debug? So I need to CD to that. And now here was here is count A. By the way, let's here's another little command. If we do ls-l for the long form, prints each one on a file, and the ones that start with a D here. So here, this is um, this is the CMake files. The fact that there's a D here means that that is a directory. All right. And this is read, write, execute, access for the. There's three sets of read, write, access. Uh, permissions for file permissions for file sharing, and what we want, what we're going to do is this, this, this count A 
is not a directory because it doesn't have a D here. And this count A is the executable for the C++ program. Now watch this. The way to execute this is you, you do dot slash and then count A. And then on the command line argument, you just type that after that. You just type it. So if I say 10 here, the value of my max is 10, the value, and it should be 20, it's 20, okay? And I, and oh, and there's a really neat up arrow. Up arrow repeats the previous, it's the history. It pre, pre, it, see, I'm, I'm doing up arrow, up arrow, up arrow. So let me go down arrow to get this back. And we'll go up arrow. So can I want to change this to, to a, a thousand? Press return. The value, see how fast this is compared to the GUI? So 1,000 should be 2,000. It is 2,000. Let's go. I think if we do this several times, we might be able to get, ooh. This time it was only 1971. So usually when you do it for 1,000, it's correct. But occasionally you'll get, there's correct again, correct again, correct again. And But here's another 19, here's the 1950. Incorrect. And of course, if you do it for 10,000, it'll always be wrong. I mean, it'll, are you with me? See, there it is, 10,000, 11,528, 11,854, boom, boom. All right, so now, so that's how you do the command line. That's how you do the command line um, with um, C++ using, um, C lion. Now let's cd. Okay, if we if you do cd dot dot, that goes up one level. And let's see where we are by doing ls. All right. And so now we are still in the CPP distribution. So let's cd up one more level. Ls. And now we're back to. Now now let me show you how to. Now this is the Java distribution, right? That's where our Java code was. So now let me sh let me show you how to do the to execute the Java program with the command line interface in the terminal using it with the IntelliJ. Okay, so let's um, cd to there. And now um, and so now here is the out folder. Now let me show you that. Here, let's go back to the IntelliJ. If you scroll down here, you'll notice that in Java, the executables are in this folder called out. And inside this out, there's a folder called production. And inside this production, there's going to be a count A. And inside this count A, there's going to be the the lowercase c count A package. And here, this count A dot class, this count A dot class is the object bytecode that we were talking about. And this is what the Java virtual machine has to take as input. So with looking at this hierarchy, let's go back to the command line. And let's cd, so not, let's cd into that out folder. So let's cd out. And let's take a look there. And sure enough, here's this production. See this production corresponded to this production folder right here, right? So let's cd change directory into the production. And here's all of our and so here, this count A right here on the command line, this count A corresponds to this count A, this package. Are you with me? All right, so let's CD into count A. And now here is the package, the count A package. Now, and if we, we can take a look at that in, Without CD, without changing the directory into there, let's let's do ls count a, and see here is that count a dot class. Now here's how you do it: you keep you stay in 
this capital C count a directory and when we do an and and if we do if we ls this directory we have this we are in this count a is the package and what you do is this now here's the key we are not going to execute that class we are going to execute the java virtual machine so the way you execute the java virtual ma machine is you say java now what do you want to give the java virtual machine as the input you want to give it you want to give it count a and then inside that count a there was let me see what was inside there the dot class there was a capital c count a dot class but now here's the thing you don't do dot class you say count a and space and now i'm going to do 10 for the uh, command line argument. And there it is. It's 10. My max n should be 20. And it is 20. We do it, we repeat it. Up arrow. And here again. 10, 20, 20. Now, but now let's do this. Instead of doing 10, let's do... ...10,000. And here again... Now we get interleaving. All right, so that's how you do the command line stuff. Okay, so now let's go back to, this is a long demo. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go back to IntelliJ. And instead of looking at, um, oh, here's a little handy trick, by the way. If you want to collapse everything, you just go boom, collapse, and then expand, and everything has been collapsed. So now now what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to take a look at count B. Um, we'll go into the source, count B, and here's the source for count B. We'll take a look at this on the slides as well in a bit, but for right now. Basically, I want, what I want to demo is this. We have, on the Java side, we also have, I have written a, in, the, in a utilities directory, the same random delay function. Okay, the same random delay that we did with um, this on the C++ side. And the, direct, the utilities directory is down here. It's util450. And we can look at this here. We can expand this out. And here is, so we go to the source. And then here's the package, util450. And here is the source of the utilities, and this this is the this is the code that you do. This is the way you do the code for in Java. How you do that? This is the random delay for Java that corresponds to the same thing in C++, and it's a little bit easier to implement. There's a math.random thing, and and here it's called sleep again, and so we sleep for so many milliseconds. Okay, and we could print out the delay if we wanted to uncomment that line. So let's go to so let's let's actually it's just so that we can see what we're doing here let's just put count b up here dot java and let's come here to um count b and let's run it and here again it's always going to run with 10. the value of n is 13. what should the value of n be it should be 20 right let's run it again Ooh, 13 again. Should be varying. Ah, there it is, 14. So each time we run it, this is really slow. Well, like I said, that oh, here's 12. Like we said, Java is a lot slower than uh, C++ when you execute it. 15. So that's the demo of count b.java. All right, end of demo. Now, let's recap a few of the things that we saw in this demo. First, let's review what we did with the C++ um, project where we executed the machine language program for count A on the command line. Now, 
remember what we did is we did dot slash count a and what was count a that was the machine language program that was generated by the compiler and then after that command we put 10 which was the command line argument now you we, we can see then that this corresponds directly to this figure uh, 7.26 where they where the count a when we executed dot slash count a we were executing the object of the machine language program in the second run there okay so that was an example of compilation instead of interpretation and notice that how different that is from the java execution of the java bytecode on the command line you see we typed we didn't type count a which was the bytecode instead we typed java we execute we didn't execute count a directly we executed java so we typed java which is the java command and that executed the java virtual machine and then for the input to the java virtual machine we have this package count a lowercase slash capital c count a and that is the bytecode that was generated by the Java compiler that is input to the Java virtual machine and then followed by the 10 which is the command line argument. So you can see that even the syntax and the format of the way you execute a program is different for compilation as opposed to interpretation. In compilation you are executing the output of the compiler, which is a machine language program. But in interpretation, you are executing a virtual machine and giving the bytecode that was generated by the compiler to the virtual machine to interpret. And that's why Java is slower than, uh, than C++. And here again, in the second part of figure 7.26, it graphically shows that the object bytecode that was that is generated is not executed directly but instead is one of the inputs to the Java virtual machine. And now let's recount what happened when we executed count b.java. It was similar to count b.cpp and we put those random delays in there and we made multiple runs and the multiple runs were not predictable even though we were doing it for a small value of 10 and the random sleep delays were long enough to trigger a timeout which forced the interrupt to occur. And then here is the a slide for the code for count b.java which we looked at uh, in the um, IDE, the IntelliJ IDE. And here is the main program for count b.java. And here again, we will explain this a bit later, but we have to put the p.join and the q.join in the try statement. And then here is the um, utilities that we, are, that we provide with the Java uh, distribution for this uh, programming paradigms class. Now, let's, let's talk about the difference between a thread and a process. And I alluded to this before, and here it is on this slide. So, like processes, threads are also programs during execution. However, a thread is under control of a process, whereas a process is under control of the operating system. Are you with me on that? So whenever you write a main program, the, it's, the operating, it's the operating system that is, you know, that is running your main program. And then, if your, and then your program spawns threads. So the, so the threads are under the control of the, of the main program, and the main program is under control of the operating system. Now, it's true that the operating system scheduler schedules the threads, okay? It's not the program that's doing the scheduling of the thread. That's, that's because, because both processes and threads are running at the same time. Okay, and for those of you who have Macs, check this out.
So there is a great app that is called, I think it's in utilities here, and it is called, um, what's it called? Activity Monitor up here. Now watch what happens. If you guys know about Activity Monitor? You should, you should know how this works. If you're a computer science, check this out. The Activity Monitor is provided by uh, Mac OS, and what it does, and there's equivalent ones on other platforms, and what we have up here is an Activity Monitor, and look what it says, all processes. Now check this out, you guys. Here we have, on the left, this is the process name. So each one of these is a, each one of these is a process in the operating system. So here's the Finder, here's BBEdit, that's my text editor that's open. Here's uh, Dropbox. And look, here's Activity Monitor itself. So Activity Monitor is monitoring the activity of Activity Monitor. How do you like that? And check this out. So that, this is the name of the, um, of the process. And here is the uh, percent of the CPU that it's using. So here the Activity Monitor is using 0.7% of the CPU. Do you see that? Here, let's highlight it. Now it's using 2.4. Now a few seconds later, it's using 0.9% of the CPU. All right. This is the total CPU time that it has used. And check this out. Over here, here's the PID. Now do you remember that what the PID is? Do you remember when we did the... Um, when we uh, talked about the process control blocks, and one of the things that the operating system does is it, signs, it assigns an integer. So this is the process ID. So this is the integer that the operating system assigned to this process. All right. And not only that, and not only that, check this out, you guys. Here we have threads. All right. And look, what this is saying is that activity monitor has six threads. So you see then, oh here, that's one of them completed. So now it has five threads. And here we can go down, didn't we say that um, NetBeans is open? Let's find NetBeans. Where is NetBeans? Holy cow, look at all these processes. Here's my screen flow. This is the, <laughs> this is the app that's recording this app. <laughs> this, uh, where is, oh here's Mail. Mail is, oh look, Mail has, Mail has, oh, I, clicked it when it moved. Where's my net beans? Or here, maybe if we sort this by name, we can go to net beans. Oh, yeah. Oops, reverse alphabetic. Here it is, net beans. Okay. So here's net beans and check this out. Net beans is running with 37 threads. Okay, so it's really spawned. This one NetBeans process, process ID 17650, has, um, this one process has 38 threads running under it. Okay, and you can see here's uh, Notification Center has three threads running in the background. Uh, here's the QuickTime player has six. Here's Safari, here's the browser. It's running with 15 threads. So this is a really nice graphic um, graphical uh, display of, of how many. Uh, in fact, here, check this out. Here, here's, here's a typical one for this laptop. There are 194 processes and, and 982 threads. You see the threads are, are, living, are being created and are dying as we speak. So it looks like our number of processes is running steady at about 195, but they're spawning and, and terminating these threads to the tune of about 969, 958 total. And here's, here's another thing, um, just to show you, let me see, I think if I go here to window, we can do the, um, our view. Oh wait, what do I want here? I think there's, um, Oh yeah, this, this CPU. Oh yeah, so check this out, you guys. This, <laughs> this my machine is a four core. It has four physical cores, and this is a little picture of the usage of um, of the uh, cores. Now what happens is there's two there's two virtual cores in each physical core. So it looks like there's eight 
uh, CPUs here, but there's actually only four physical ones, and there's that's that's a topic for another day. Uh, what these what these virtual cores are, but anyway, there's actually four physical cores, but then there's eight logical cores because there's two virtual cores per physical core. So so this so this is a multi-core machine to the tune of four physical cores. And I think this is an Intel i7. So anyway, I think this is a great. Uh, visual demonstration and picture of how these processes are running in the operating system and the operating system is switching between these processes putting them on the ready queue taking them off all as we speak and then within each process we have these threads being spawned okay, okay. so here we have this next slide threads versus processes a process is a program during execution in an operating system and processes communicate via message passing Whereas a thread is a program during execution in a process, and threads communicate via shared memory. So that's how that's the model that we use in, in both the C minus minus and in Java is that the, and the share, by the shared memory what we mean is that common variable that was global that both of them have access to. You see what I mean? So that so that that is in the memory space of the process. Okay, that's that's in the memory space of the process. Where, whereas one process doesn't share memory with another process, so they can't communicate that way. So they have to they have to commu communicate via message passing. And then uh, this next slide uh, goes into detail of what we already uh, just described before: the action of p dot start and p dot join. And um, and. Uh, remember I said Sestoft, the book by Sestoft is a really good detailed book of what, of, um, of the, uh, the details of the Java uh, execution model. And um, this is a description of, from Sestoff. This is, uh, I took this out of page 70. You should read uh, Sestoff section 16.3. U.start changes the state of U to enabled so that its run method will be called when a processor becomes available and u.join waits for thread u to die, may throw interrupted, ex interrupted exception if the current thread is interrupted by, while, while wait, waiting, running. Okay, now, you remember this, remember this figure? And, and th here, so here's the start. So here we said create process puts the process's process control block in the ready queue. So here's the ready queue, it goes to run, it times out, it comes back to the ready queue, running, times out to the ready queue. Now watch this. This is a very simplified version. Are you ready for this one? This is the figure from Sestoff to page 67. Now look. And so this is the detail, but it, look, it's, it has exactly the same shape. But look at it here. Here, what he calls enabled is what we called ready. So when I say the ready queue, he says the enabled queue. I say tomato, you say tomato, I say ready, he says enabled. Okay? But it's the same thing. There's a queue of process control blocks that are enabled that the operating system will schedule at some point in time. And start puts the process, so you see start, that's, that's on the transition from, the, from, from here to here, from the, from, from the created to the enabled state, from the created state to the enabled state. Start puts that process control block there. Then what happens is, it, when it's scheduled, it goes to the running state, and then when it's when it's preempted, like, preempted is what a, the timeout would do. It comes to here, so it goes between here and here and here and here, right? And then Q, you know, so P would go and go and go back and forth. Q would start up and it would go back and forth. The main program is already running, so the main program is already going back and forth. Do you see what I mean? Then what happens is. Here's the effect of join. Now, who executes join? Main executes join, right? Main, main executes u.join, right? So suppose main is, is here running and main executes u.join and furthermore, suppose u, process u is what? It's still enabled. In other words, it hasn't died. Then what was that going to do to main? That's gonna, what's that going to do to main? That's going to put main in what? in joining you. Now what do you suppose this is? This is another queue of process control blocks. 
So now Maine's process control block is here in, in this state. And then what happens is, when U finally dies, then what happens to Maine? It, it goes what? Back and is ready to be scheduled again. Now, do you see how that works? This thing by Sestoff is really, really good. This shows all the details of precisely, great title. This is precisely what happens with join and start. And it shows all of the, it, this shows the execution model of Java. This is the execution model of Java. It's a great diagram. And do you see how that, do you see conceptually what's going on there? Are we good? Okay, so you, you, we need to study that. And then the, so here's the action of p.start and p.join. After p and q start, there could be three concurrent executions. p executing its run method, q executing its run method, and main executing its statements after starting q. And p.join is not executed by, ped, by thread p, it is executed by main. And that is a source of a whole lot of confusion. I mean, a lot of people just program blindly and don't get that. But you have to, you, that, that, is precisely, that is precisely what happens. All right, good deal. Let's see, do you have a homework assignment due today or it's Monday? I think it's another one of those interleaving. Oh, do you? I don't think you have to do a program for Monday, do you? Or do you? Has somebody looked that up? Look that up and refresh your... Hold on before we quit here. Let's get this verified. Hey, I think they're all written. I think we're still on the written. You, you, we'll, yeah, not quite yet to do some programs of the whole thing. Okay, good deal. See you next time.